Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming this morning. The session will be rather short. We're, we lost already seven minutes this morning, so I, I will skip introductions. Um, the, the purpose of this morning's session is really to be um, taking a deeper look into what responsible sourcing implies uh, in terms of understanding risks, um, understanding the available solutions, uh, getting a better understanding of the, the work that's being done by refiners, and also uh, looking ahead and trying to think about what are the solutions that are available to help, in particular, artisanal and small-scale miners around the world um, enhance their inclusion in, in global supply chains of, of precious metals. I have a very solid group of speakers today with me. Um, I'm delighted to have them. I know most of them uh, already. Um, and again, without further ado, I'd like to, to um, power ahead in, in the session that will be structured around three main themes. The first one uh, looking at really the sort of uh, risk situation in a number of geographies um, that are supplying material, not just to the UAE, but of course also to the UAE. Um, we've, we've heard about due diligence, we've heard about uh, anti-money laundering. All of this requires solid risk information uh, to be collected and shared um, in the industry with, with the various market players. So that would be the first part of the, of the conversation. Um, then we will be turning on how is it practically used and implemented, uh, taking a look at um, how due diligence is, is um, put into motion by, by refiner established here in, in the UAE. And then the third section, session, or part of the session, will be looking at, as I said, the incentives and, and what could be done um, to support uh, artisanal and small-scale miners. So um, I will turn to the first uh, set of three speakers um, to, to really shed some light on, on the various risks existing in, in, in production countries. Uh, we'll try to be covering various part, parts of the African continents. Um, and I'd like to invite you, Zobel, um, if you could very briefly introduce yourself and then uh, share a perspective on, on Central Africa. Thank you, Louis. Um, I mean, I work for the United Nations group of experts on the GRC. Uh, in, this, in this capacity, I, I conduct field investigations into the financing of armed groups and criminal networks to the exploitation and trade of natural resources. I'm aware we don't have enough time, so I will just try to share some ideas that we could discuss during this session or even during the day. So, First, allow me to, to start by saying that my view does not represent the position of the United Nations because I'm not the spokesperson of the United Nations. So to, to start, I would like to say that uh, it is really important when we talk about risks and vulnerabilities to bear in mind that we, we talk about regions I mean, the Great Lakes or even Central African or West African region where I also had to conduct some investigation. We talk about regions with very porous borders, which means we cannot think that there is a watertight border between the producing country and also the transit country. In other words, what is produced in country A is often exported as a product from country B, just a few kilometers away. Also, the problems regarding the chain in the producing country very often extend to the transit country. My other point related to the involvement of armed groups and criminal networks in the exploitation of natural resources. I cannot be exhaustive here, but the main point is that these groups continue to have a physical and visible presence on the production sites. On the other hand, they are invested in the taxation of producers and transporters of the minerals. It's a very lucrative business. For example, I have in mind one group in one particular country that earns more or less 20,000 USD a month just by taxing one production site. So if you realize that we have several armed groups and thousands of 
mining sites, you can just imagine how much money they can make. It's also important to say that the taxation is done by cash or to minerals. These minerals are then sold on the local market or in neighboring countries. To conclude in the, on the involvement of armed groups or armed elements, I would like to mention that there are an increasing number of cases where the national security forces, even though this is, very, this is forbidden, are using their positions to engage in illegal mining activities. There is a division between officers and the troops, so the former very often own the production tools, while the latter are involved in the taxation at every stage of the chain. I would like now to turn, on, to, turn to the money laundering issue, particularly in gold sector. In several production sites, there is an absence or lack of banking facilities. As a result, there is a huge flow of funds from transit countries and from final destination countries. These funds are the main source of financing for illegal production and the preferred channel for illegal exports. For example, we recently accessed to the account of one key player in one particular country who bought the equivalent of three tons in five months during this year, but the export statistics shows that uh, the player just export five kilograms during the same year, during the same period, I mean. So, so that's a significant quantity that went out to illegal channels and flooded the market. So let us talk about the responsibility of the representative of the state. To say that they are sometimes associated with criminal networks and they very often remain, maintain the feeling of impunity in the sector. I must also admit that they are in a very complicated situation, especially when the central government decided to leave the security to private companies or to armed groups that they have decided to support. So, I would like to conclude by saying that the point I've just raised should not be seen as problems, but challenges. And I believe we, we are collectively able to face those challenges. As everyone knows, the region is rich in resources. Their exploitation can have a considerable impact on the development of the countries and the population and even contribute to conflict transformation as several studies have shown. But now, the, for me, the, the real question is, is not whether we should exploit or not, but the real question is how do we exploit the resources, with whom we work, under what conditions we import them, and what rules we impose ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Zobel. Um, we'll, we'll be moving on to another part of, of the continent now with, with Kenneth. I understand you've been back from extensive um, field research in two specific countries with differing profiles, um, Ethiopia and Mauritania. Um, could you please share some of the insights and, and takeaways that you've uh, uh, been able to collect from, from those two countries? And please stick to five minutes because it's, it's quite a short session. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Uh, just a brief introduction. My name is Kenneth Khalko. I'm a director with AKW. And I'm responsible for sustainability and responsible business. I have almost uh, three decades of experience uh, doing reviews, supply chain reviews uh, across many countries. Uh, you know, I've done uh, reviews in difficult uh, terrains, difficult countries. I'm not going to take the names. Uh, they, they include countries in Asia. They include countries in Africa. 
I'm looking forward to traveling to Peru. Uh, I would have done more than 3,000 uh, site visits, and I'm going to share my experience. I would like to begin by saying that supply chains are complex and very, very difficult to map. And that is what makes them very, very challenging. Any kind of review, any kind of management systems which you are trying to place uh, becomes very difficult. It complicates the task of the compliance function. The reason for that is supply chains transcend international borders. Uh, they go from the so-called developed countries into the least developed countries, from formal sectors into informal sectors, from urban pockets into rural pockets, from downstream to your upstream suppliers. And that is what makes the risk and the vulnerabilities very, very challenging for any, any compliance team, any proactive supplier, supply chain actor to address. Now, I would begin by saying, you know, you, we talk about human rights, we talk about child labor, uh, we, we go on a site visit, we do not come across any child labor, we don't see any serious human rights obligation, uh, serious human rights abuses. But, you know, you, that, that is good news, but when you go back, uh, has that risk being mitigated? The risk is always there. Unless you have proper policies, procedures, and processes in place, along with documentation, and I'm, I'm actually referring to the OECD first step, which is the management system. I think the second biggest risk is not knowing. Not knowing is a bigger risk. And we, we should actually not be afraid. We should go and find out what this risk is. And this is, this is what the second step talks about, identification and assessment of risk. If you don't know the risk, how can you manage it? There is always a risk of one rotten apple. You may have put in tremendous efforts over the years, but that one rotten apple is enough to bring down your reputation. Now, to identify the risks and to assess them, you need a robust compliance function. And, and, and it's not an ordinary skill set to have. You, you need specialists who are very good in seeing, seeing beyond, who, who can talk to people, talk to process owners, who have great discussion and interview skills. So one of the biggest risks which I have observed is that the compliance function uh, is weak. You need to have a very, very strong compliance function. Believe me, it's an investment. It's an insurance. The third important point I need to talk about is you know, you've come across a risk, but don't brush it under the carpet. Do something about it. You don't know. You cannot assess the kind of impact it can have. You need to do something about it. You need to act. And lastly, I would like to talk about, you know, having a third-party audit done, an independent third-party audit done. Be brave enough. You should know what are the control deficiencies, what are the gaps. You have to address them. They call a spade a spade. You need to also tell your stakeholders they want to know. They want to know what you're doing. You need to report, you need to document. On vulnerabilities, I would say we should have a vulnerability index in place. 
I'm, I'm sorry, Kenneth. I'll need to ask you to wrap up as we need to move along. Sure. Distance can be a vulnerability. Migration can be a vulnerability. Lack of finance can be a vulnerability. Briefly on Mauritania and Ethiopia, I've been there. I've interacted with the process owners, the government agencies, and I'm very happy to share that the legal frameworks are there in the country. They are taking proactive measures. In Mauritania, they have an organization called Modern Mauritani, which actually has control centers both for extracting and for processing. Uh, they are helping the artisanal miners uh, by supporting them, by providing them with protective equipment, by providing them with medical facilities. In, in Ethiopia, I, I, I would like to, uh, you know, compliment uh, the, the National Bank of Ethiopia, which is working closely with the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia, who has presence across regions uh, to look at the documentation. They're working closely uh, with the Ministry of Mines and the Geological Survey, and, and they are focusing on documentation and monitoring. Uh, I, I don't have much time, so I would yeah. like to end uh, with a number of Cs uh, which, which you can actually see, look at. You know, it is important to collaborate to cooperate, to consult community engagement, to engage with the communities. The downstream suppliers should engage with the up upstream suppliers. And it is, it is very, very important to work together, collaborate. Thank you, Thank Kenneth. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know it's frustrating, but we do only have one hour. Um, Thierry, moving on to you and reminding you of the clock, which I have under my ass. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you again for everyone participating and your excellencies and DMCC, your commitment to um, not only being a trade hub, but doing it correctly um, and doing it in a responsible way. Uh, my name is Thierry Dangala. I am a founder of uh, Accountable Africa. We provide uh, supply chain analysis and kind of strategic advisory work around supply chains uh, for gold, particularly. Um, one, one, my perspective, you know, so I used to be in, uh, a senior advisor in, uh, for Africa in U.S. Congress. Uh, we did a lot of work around sanctions law and worked with U.S. Treasury on that. And uh, after I left uh, my time in U.S. government, I founded Accountable Africa to kind of advise and um, advise and, and, and give counsel to institutional investors mostly, but buyers who were interested in being responsible, um, mostly because of reputational risk, as you were discussing. You know, they kind of want an insurance policy that uh, it's not going to bite them in the butt, you know, later after buying. Uh, or sourcing gold from certain places. But in my experience in, uh, I guess we've, I've been in advising for gold sourced in maybe three different countries or three different regions, West, Central, and East Africa. And as much as the board, and I heard LBMA talk about this, like the board responsibility to kind of uh, look at the implications of their decisions to source, you know, the gold and, what I'm starting to notice is community buy-in really affects the, you know, you're talking about the data around the gold that you're buying. Uh, it affects the quality of that data. Uh, you know, if you have communities that are taking pride um, uh, in um, what's being produced from their community, you know, the fact that, you know, they'll, they'll be interested in the fact that, okay, there's schools, the children are still going to schools in these communities, and a lot of times that happens because of partnerships with mining companies and so on and so forth. So I just want to encourage those, of, those um, who are uh, looking at this responsible sourcing framework to not just see it as a kind of a board discussion, but you're actually involving communities to take pride in the, 
in the in the products in the, in the gold being produced in their communities. And so I I, I really think that the narrative that DMCCs uh, or that uh, UAE is developing around the data is really going to be filled in with uh, you know community involvement uh, with the communities that are producing uh, the gold. That's my little perspective. Thank you very much uh, for sticking to the time, and I'll, I'm sure I'll be coming back to you later on. Um, just moving on to, to the second part of that, of that session, which is really trying to better understand how practically um, companies in the supply chain, and in particular refiners, are using this kind of, of information. Um, I'm turning to you, Jamie. Could, could you share a bit on, on your experience working as a compliance officer at Al Al Itihad, um, the challenges um, in particular in relation to on-site? visits um, and uh, the challenges and key learnings and some recommendations that you can share with, with other refiners and, and companies in the room today. Yeah. Thank you, Luis, for giving me the opportunity to, to share my experience as a compliance officer, especially based here in Dubai. Uh, so we all know that a lot of ASM uh, gold materials are actually coming into the UAE and as uh, what Kevin and I discussed that the UAE has, has serviced the ASM sector, uh, especially for gold. So uh, that poses a lot of challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge that I don't think that uh, is, should be a deterrent for a refiner to source uh, ASM. We should always, like uh, what I believe is, always go back to the OECD due diligence guidance and then understand what are the risks uh, that you have to look for. Because most of the time we all talk about, okay, uh, there are risks in the supply chains, but what risks are you actually looking for? So first you have to identify the type of material that you are sourcing, because depending on the type of material, uh, the risk uh, may be different. So there is a uh, different risk profile for uh, mine gold, there's different risk profile for recycled gold. So you always have to go on a risk-based approach. So uh, also, the, you have to understand the origin and understand that uh, you don't like do uh, like a blanket assessment. Okay, this country is high risk, so we're not going to source. No, you have to, to dig deep on what are the risks on that particular supply chain. So there are a lot of available information where you could gather uh, evidence. So when you do the on-site assessment, it would be easier for you to, to like, okay, plan on which sites you are going to visit because most of the time if you are sourcing from ASM, uh, it could be like X number of sites. So to be the, uh, to, for your visit to be effective, not only that you have to identify which sites that you are going to go, but you also have to be partnering with a local actor or, or, or a local, it could be the exporter, it could be the local buyer, uh, and the specialist, of course, uh, to, to be able to maximize the time because most of the time you're not going to be on the site for like weeks. Uh, it could be a couple of days. And we all know that as my colleague here mentioned, you know, you could go on that site and then see, okay, we didn't fi find any risk. But when, once you leave, you could, you could not tell. So there is uh, an importance of engagement of everyone in the supply chain. So there should be like on the ground assessment team that is composed of, let's say, the ASM miners or the local traders or the exporters. And then, yeah, I, I believe for me that is the most effective way uh, to do that. Then another challenge that we, we, we face is that whenever we talk to, let's say, a local trader, uh, I don't know what I'm going to ask, you know. There, there are available questionnaires or available toolkits that you could use, but sometimes that doesn't uh, apply to particular supply chain because it's really very complex, you know. It's not like there is a one uh, shoe that will fit all, you know, for for all types of supply chain. So I think right now, craft, craft code is one of the tools that is uh, being revised now to include uh, the gap. You know, there is a gap between the ASMs and the, let's say, the refiners. Most of the time, we all talk about the ASM miners, the refiners, but we fail to include 
the people that are between that uh, uh, supply chain, you know. So I think it's about time that these people will also have to take responsibility to ensure that we are sourcing responsibly. It's not just the, the responsibility of the ASM miner or the refiner to achieve that, yeah. you know. So everyone has to be on board, yeah. Thank you, that's, that's a key point indeed. I mean, there's, there's, we speak of a sort of division of labor, of due diligence along the supply chain. So all actors actually have to, to play ball. Um, very quickly, John, I'd like to, to turn to you. You, you. you represent some of the biggest mining companies in, in the world, gold mining companies. Um, speaking from, taking it from the other side, I'd like to ask you if, if you have any feedback from your member companies on, on the extent to which the supply chain is actually asking for those kind of information, because due diligence covers large-scale mining, of course. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'd like to, first of all, just take a step back because we talk about the ASM sector, and I'm just going to challenge that. I think context is key, and we've already heard there's a big difference between the DRC and the Great Lakes region, Ethiopia, Mauritania, Peru, Colombia. These are not um, supply chains in the, in the sense that the kind of industrialized world know them. So, so we, context is key. That means that solutions have to be customized to the context. Um, one of the advantages of being a member organization uh, with a council of uh, large-scale miners is we can talk to them and say, okay, what are your experiences? What, because many, many times you are co-resident or neighbor with artisanal miners in a vast uh, array or uh, divergence of contexts. Now, we did, uh, to, to plug some of our own work, we looked at this uh, in detail uh, a year or so ago, and we basically said, what lessons have all of those large-scale miners learned from that engagement, from trying to, to both engage, support, responsible ASM, and I think, again, this is key, we're talking about responsible mining and responsible um, sourcing. The LSM sector is fairly simple in some ways because large-scale mining is very similar. But as soon as you move to all of this, this divergence and difference, you have to say, what is the responsible practice that is possible in that context? Uh, so, sorry, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so one, of the things, one of the things we've learned is context is absolutely key. Uh, also, there's limits to informality. You have to basically know who you're um, building a relationship with, and that's one of the other lessons, then the, in, the endurance or durability, the persistence of the relationship. Continuity is key, which comes to another learning, partnerships, and very, very importantly, and I don't think it's been mentioned much yet, the role of government, both national and often local government. How do you incentivize the government to support enduring progress on the ground, and that's often very significantly lacking. So you're often operating in an area where there's limited capacity, often limited rule of law. How do you build that trust you need at the local level? So all of those things, I think, are absolutely key. Uh, Large-scale miners have undoubtedly experienced them. One of the lessons we've learned by looking at the, the kind of history is how difficult this is. And that issue of Continuity is key. Generally, you do it in partnership. I mentioned, again, another lesson, partnership. Generally, you do it in, in partnership, but that partnership has to stay in place for a lot longer than a lot of um, external parties are used to. And if we look at the role of international development banks, for instance, having them commit for long-term projects is key. So I think there are some of the learnings. What I would say before, and I know we're running out of time, what I would say is the change in position and strategic perceptions of the large-scale mining industry. 10, 15 years ago, this was undoubtedly risk management. It was undoubtedly often risk aversion. I think now there is a clear recognition that you need to have constructive collaboration. You need to be aware of your responsibilities, often outsized responsibilities, meaning beyond your corporate boundaries or the, or the boundaries of the mine. And I think that's definitely a lesson that's been learned over the last 10 to 15 years. Thank you. V very quick follow-up question from me. I mean, some of your member companies are operating in complex um, areas and situations. Any feedback from, from those companies on the type of risk that they, they, they have to face and the challenges that they're confronted with? Well, I, I think the 
as you say, they are currently operating in some very challenging environments. I think the context is key because, frankly, you need a degree of stability to be able to contribute, to create value, to build those relationships. And one of the things that we are seeing in certain locations, I won't go into detail, but certain locations, is the externalities, the things that are well beyond your control in terms of geopolitical risks, in terms of um, a shift in the security environment, for instance. So I think what we're, what we're learning is you need to incentivize, as I say, how do you build that capacity? How do you get government support? That, I think, is a, a key learning. Thanks a lot, and that's actually a perfect segue into the last part of the, of the discussion, uh, looking at the kind of incentives and support that we, we can create together. One key word that I would like to mention here that was not really uh, flagged before is, is the concept of progressive improvement meaning how do we, over time, build capacities of the various actors in, in the supply chain. Of course, the artisanal miners, but the traders, the exporters, potentially the, the banking and financial institutions surrounding that. So, Kevin, I'd like to turn to you now, um, focusing precisely on those, on those various, various aspects. Uh, progressive improvement, financing, building capacities of local traders. On to you. Thank you very much, Louis. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Your Excellency. I'd like to also thank Sudish from the DMCC. Thank you again, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, I think there are some very, uh, you know, we could have some um, simple phrases to describe uh, how to really do practical things. Um, and I've, we've heard this from all of the speakers so far. I think we heard from Kenneth, you need the right eyes. Okay, that's an important topic. Um, you do need expertise. Um, but a, a slogan that I like to use is engage to improve, which is another form of saying progressive improvement. So the OECD has its progressive improvement, its progressive due diligence strategy, which means it's not a red light or a green light, uh, engage or not engage, it's an assessment. And if there are certain risks, um, really terrible risks that aren't present, you're allowed to engage and then help uh, that community, that group improve. And I want to point out though that this strategy of engage to improve or progressive improvement doesn't apply just to artisanal miners or artisanal mining communities, but to all of the actors involved. I would say all of the actors uh, on the stage and all of the actors that are here uh, in Dubai. And I'll, I'll just to be clever, I'll point out that, um, for example, the World Gold Council, uh, the LBMA, I've been, uh, I'm long in the tooth, I've been very uh, uh, involved with artisanal mining for about uh, probably getting close to 30 years. It's been my entire career. I've visited more than, more than 500 artisanal mine sites in, uh, in about 30 different countries. And um, initially, the LBMA and the World Gold Council in the beginning of my career were more or less outright hostile towards uh, artisanal mining. But through engagement, we've had an engage to improve process. And they are here now, I think for quite a while now, just to be uh, fair, it's very wonderful that they have changed that tune. They're here now proclaiming the importance of being able to engage with these more informal parts of the supply chain. So there's a nice uh, engage to improve example for you. <clears throat> and let me point out uh, something about Dubai. So I've known Dubai uh, since about 2011. In fact, I think I know the first two compliance officers in Dubai. There's Abed uh, CP, who's somewhere here, and Jamie Bellino, who I've had the pleasure to know for quite a long time. <clears throat> if we use the slogan, engage to improve, progressive improvement, along the lines of the OECD's kind of framework, well, Dubai is really the center for engagement with the artisanal mining sector. For a variety of reasons, it has been for a long time. During my experience in knowing Dubai, uh, I can say it's certainly improved. So what it was when I first came here and what it is now in terms of compliance, uh, progressive improvement, I think it's made huge steps. Um, that's great. And I do think, though, um, we all have to recognize that to improve uh, the, the, uh, the gold supply chain, it doesn't have to just be the artisanal gold supply chain, 
we must work with the existing actors in that supply chain. We're not going to replace them and bring in a whole new cadre of, of uh, uh, partners and, and agents, etc. We have to engage with them. I like to say that 99% of all the people involved in artisanal mining are good, hard-working entre entrepreneurial people. Uh, we have to engage with them and help them improve. So let me segue quickly to the financial component, the professionalization component. So I now run an organization called uh, Artisanal Gold Enterprises, a company. Um, I do believe business development is really a way to scale up some of the important improvements that we're talking about on this panel. And um, <clears throat> we could call it a special purpose vehicle. But another way to talk about this is that mining is irreducibly complex at some level. So it requires some level of high, high level professionalization experience to do it sustainably, properly, uh, you know, in an environmentally sound way. So in the artisanal mining sector, how do you have that professional component? Where does it sit? I like to just call that a professional hub. And there's a bunch of different models. A special purpose vehicle is one of them. So you could have a special purpose vehicle, it attracts, it might have a small management team that oversees uh, the engagement with an artisanal mining supply chain. And I think we've heard that from everybody that we need a long-term commitment, we need to build partnerships, it has to involve groups like the government, and it really does need to be continuous. You need to have a continued presence and I really think that special purpose vehicles or special companies that are designed specifically to engage with the artisanal mining sector, to help it improve, to help it professionalize, are something that uh, is something that um, uh, the gold industry really should uh, emphasize or, or support. Do I have two more minutes to talk about uh, two technology? More. So technology, there's an explosion of this going on. <clears throat> Uh, I think it will really help us create data sets that bring a lot of transparency, bring a lot more knowledge forward about artisanal mining. <clears throat> we all knew there's new, there's new materials, um, there's new instrumentation, there's the miniaturization of instrumentation. Um, there's many cheap and excellent ways uh, to collect data now. There, you know, communication is almost universal all the time everywhere. So there's an increasing ability to, uh, to collect information, let's say, on an artisanal, uh, an artisanal supply chain. These could be sensors on equipment that's used. It could be, um, we, for example, have a kind of a, a, a very exciting device that creates a birth certificate for little pieces of gold um, <laughs> that you can then accumulate this information. And I think artificial intelligence uh, is a wonderful way to look at the cloud of data that we can create and identify anomalies, and we can use AI to help um, understand if some of the, if there are new risks appearing in the supply chain, for example. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we've mentioned already, the, you know, how important it is to build capacities of all actors in the supply chain. And I'd like to focus a bit more on local aggregators, uh, local traders and aggregators and exporters. And, Coming back to you, Jamie, I'd like to know if this is also part of your work, engaging with those actors in the supply chain to build their capacity, economic and technological, but also in terms of the ability to meet due diligence expectations. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to be able to have like an effective supply chain due diligence and uh, uh, manage the risk and mitigate the risk that you found along the way, you have to be really... Uh, work closely with, regard, uh, with your uh, local suppliers. It could be like the, the exporter, it could be the local trader. But uh, as I've said, most of the time, uh, we as a refiner, we try to educate them. Uh, first, we share the supply chain policy. We explain to them what are the risks in, in the supply chain that we need to identify. And as I've said earlier, I think uh, most of the forums where we discuss responsible sourcing, uh, those actors in the middle are not 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 very uh, uh, what you, what what do you 
uh, say, they're not very present and they are not included in the discussion. So I think it's about time that we don't focus only on the refiners. So uh, for us, as I've said, uh, we try to educate as much as we can, but then sometimes when they see the load of the work that you have to do to do uh, supply chain due diligence up to the ground, they will just disengage. So this is the challenge that we are facing right now that as much as we would want to uh, uh, source more ASM gold, it's only possible if, for example, the local exporter or is willing to share their supply chain to us for us to help them to identify what are the risks and how do we manage those risks. So the risk mitigation strategies are, very, uh, are it's already written, it's in the OECD uh, due diligence guidance. So whatever risk you find uh, in the supply chain could be mitigated, except for the, you know, if there are uh, presence of human rights abuse or there is uh, uh, support to armed groups or their conflict in the area, that's obviously you have to disengage. But there are other risks that could be mitigated by working closely with them to improve uh, the, the uh, supply chain. So most of the time that is not not only the on-site due diligence, because some people will expect that, okay, you did the site visit, then it ends there. It doesn't, you know? So the site visit is just a gateway for you to develop the risk mitigation. So for the risk mitigation to be effective, everyone has to be onboarded and everyone has to commit on that. So not only the local exporter and aggregators, but as, uh, as uh, our colleague here mentioned as well, is that the government also has to be supportive of that and they have to accept that this is the new uh, way on how we are going to bring in more ASM material to the formal supply chain. Yeah. Thank you, that's, that's really a very valid point. I mean, a lot of attention focuses on support to artisanal mining communities and for the right reasons, but indeed you need to build the capacity throughout the supply chain. Um, and there's a lot that's being asked of refineries that gives me an opportunity also to uh, remind that there's a role for governments, of course the producing governments, but all other governments um, and perhaps suggestions for, for the UA governments and other in the room that may be attending, much more support is needed, including through international aid to build the capacities of the, the other players in, in the supply chain. Um, so but I don't know if I, if I can ask you that question, but considering that you've been working in on this for, for a number of years, what's, what's your perspective on you know, the amount of interest and support that you know, this part of the supply chain has been receiving as opposed to artisanal miners um, in the context of the Congo and other places in Africa? The, it's, it's heartwarming to see that uh, the legal framework is there in most of the countries. Uh, the regulators are very, very proactive. I'll, I'll give you some examples. I've already talked about uh, Mauritani Maiden and what it is doing. But if you, if you look at Tanzania, uh, you know, you have the Mining Commission and you have the State Mining Corporation. I think they are, they are, full, they are f taking care of 60% of the compliance function. Uh, also capacity building and, uh, and, and training. I, I came across uh, demonstration centers during my visit to Tanzania, and the demonstration centers were focusing at the ASM sector, uh, telling them what the risks are. Uh, there, were, there were physical shafts mm -hmm. and winches, how you go down the mine, what kind of protective equipment you should wear, what precautions you should take, and it's being done on a weekly basis. I was surprised to see uh, representatives from the Mining Commission around. Uh, this is, uh, you know, supervising, monitoring, helping with documentation. I think it is, it is very, very important because if formal systems are not in place, then the informal systems come in and that is what makes things exploitative very, very exploitative in nature. They, they, they also, and forgive me for using the word steal, but steal from the original miners and diggers. Mm. So it is important to put licensing, formal microfinance systems in place uh, to, to you know, take care of uh, the, 
middlemen uh, who, who may be very, very exploitative and actually they are impediments because these concerns need to be addressed first before we actually get into engaging and, and talking about more constructive and positive things. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to also ask John a, a question, but before that, uh, I wanted to mention also something that um, the OECD has been working on with the UN um, in terms of trying to think uh, around uh, the lines of incentives. So we've been trying to understand under what conditions fighters in, in, arm, in non state armed groups can be uh, sustainably transitioned from their condition of fighters and trained to become proper, um, you know, economic actors of, of mining supply chains. Um, Zobed, I'd like to ask your, your perspective on that. You think if that's something that's feasible, imaginable, welcome, um, possible? Yeah, of course. I think that's, that's probably the direction where we should go, you know, in terms of helping uh, the countries and the, the community to to reach the disarmament part, you know, because, I mean, we have, we do have success stories. I mean, uh, no, success stories maybe maybe too strong. We have we have cases where uh, armed groups remain quiet while they are waiting for the formal disarmament process because they are busy doing mining. So how can we use it to tell them, okay, guys, in fact. What you are looking for is to have the capacity to think about the future. I mean, this is a human, human right, I would say, you know, being able to think about my life in the next years. So, but this has to be done in a formal way. You know, the first, the first thing is to say uh, it is not acceptable for armed groups or criminal networks to gain us armed groups and criminal network from any benefit from the, the mining operation, you know? So, I mean, uh, maybe one last thing, if, if I can say something about it. So, it was mentioned earlier, from my experience, the message I can send to the companies here is, you cannot just rely on what people are telling you. You really have to develop your own mechanism to have your own information maybe based on your on-site visit, because this is very key. I have a lot of experiences where companies, they had the good faith, but because they rely on others' opinion, they made a lot of mistakes. Thank you very much. And I have to say also anecdotally from, from West African feedback, there are very strong indications that a number of, of young people would rather go into mining than join um, non-state armed groups uh, in Niger, in Mali in particular. So this is really something that, that would need to be further explored. Um, John, before we take a couple of questions from the audience, uh, I wanted to ask what do you think large-scale mining companies can practically do to support um, formalization of the sector, the artisanal mining sector, local exporters, etc. I know the WGC has done uh, quite a lot of thinking around that. So I'm not going to re reiterate or, or direct you again to the lessons learned document, but I am because, frankly, that's where a lot of that um, the findings are. I, I, what I would do is answer that question if you let me in a different way. It, it's not just the large scale miners. It is, as somebody else said, how does the whole supply chain come together? And what I would want to draw your attention to is the fact that. Um, with a number of global gold associations, the LBMA ourselves, several of the other associations in this room, uh, the DMCC, the China Gold Association, we agreed something called the Gold Industry Declaration of Responsibility and Sustainability Principles. It's quite a mouthful. Um, principle eight is to try and get the whole gold supply chain globally to try and understand what it means to support both improved formalization, and also reduced negative impact. But I think we need to be realistic, and I think there's, it, one of the things that's not been mentioned is scale of, of expectation or aspiration. The, the, when John Reed presented earlier and talked about that pool of liquidity, that $150 billion of gold that, that flows around the market, none of that, or very little of that, is ostensibly artisanal gold. 
because artisanal gold does not enter the formal market that way. It enters peripheral markets, niche markets, dare I say, gray markets. So the question really is how do we incentivize structural change? And we can only do that by all coming together, by all understanding what structural change means. Um, what we've had in, in, you know, certainly in the 20 years I've been working in gold is a lot of niche, small vertical supply chains. Uh, and they have, they're well, well worth applauding and they've made progress, but they haven't really made a dint in, in how we mainstream what we want to call responsible artisanal and how we draw the boundaries between responsible artisanal and some of the issues you mentioned in the Great Lakes region. So I think there's a big question about having, um, uh, setting our boundaries, our realistic definitions of what responsible sourced artisanal is and then how, that may, how we mainstream it. So that the, the large-scale miners are, doubt, are now definitely engaged in that process where they can have an influence. But frankly, it needs all of the actors, as we've heard. It needs the refiners absolutely a pinch point in terms of that process. It needs a better understanding of how we basically bring supply so that when we talk about responsible mining, it's responsible large-scale and artisanal. We're a long way from that, and I think we need to acknowledge that. We need to say, okay, well, what is the incentives for structural change? Thank you so much. We have about three minutes left, and I'd like to take a couple of questions. So if I can ask you to, to keep your responses brief. Um, Thierry, there's one question from the audience um, flagging how governments appears to be much more focused on documentation and practical engagement with local stakeholders. Um, what's your take on that? Is, is that your experience as well? Yes, um, I, you know, so it depends, if, you know, as I think it was you that was talking about customized, every supply chain is, is different. So it, some governments um, whereby, where, where the gold production is actually part of the national trade strategy, you know, a good example, I think it's Tanzania, they, they are, and that's why they've even established gold buying centers they see themselves as owners. They, they really take ownership in the, in the product. Um, so they're encouraging a lot of documentation. And, and you know what? I think um, under President, the past president, Magafuli, they even did some sort of exchange with the artisanal mining community whereby uh, they got a tax relief or something. Uh, like the, he reduced the, royal, uh, the royalties. Uh, it was a sort of exchange that the artisanal community saw, said, okay, we'll comply with your documentation request because you're giving us this on this side, you know, that sort of incentivization. And then you have other governments um, in other countries where, you know, the, um, that, let's just say the, the government and the communities have not taken ownership of the trade, therefore they've left it to the black market where, you know, documentation doesn't matter. Thank you, and, and one last complex question, um, looking for a candidate. Um, how do you see the integration of ESG principles and AI technologies shaping the future of responsible sourcing and governance in the mining industry? So I was thinking either Kevin or, or John. If I could have a crack at it. Um, so I think the, uh, you know, the whole supply chain, the technological element, I think the recognition of all the different actors coming together and understanding that um, it isn't, uh, you know, it's not just one thing. There's the custom uh, supply chain, et cetera. ESG, you know, that's a big uh, title. It's, it's writ large. I think the way to answer all of those ESG uh, demands for supply chains will be an integrated process. I do think, though, it's going to be, um, there will be an increasing amount of technology to bring insurance or assurance to um, how you can report on ESG uh, criteria uh, for your supply chain and um, there's a lot of work to be done on what the investment community or the financial community wants or will accept and I think we have to try hard uh, to stick to the progressive improvement um, strategy that uh, that the OECD has created so that we don't uh, continue to exclude a large part of the supply chain. Thank you so much. We're, the time is up. Uh, thanks for your contributions from, from my perspective. I can only say that I'm really looking forward to next year's DPMC. Uh, and we'll have a word with Sudish, but looking forward to a, a future panel on, on the first year of reporting by the refiners. 
and how the information collected can, can contribute to everything that we just discussed on the panel today. So thanks again for sticking with us and uh, looking forward to next year. Thanks again.